agenda June 2nd, 2020 pre-meeting. Uh, we will call it to order. Uh, next, we have any uh, thing on the June 2nd board agenda that needs to be looked at? Did anyone have any questions on tonight's Good agenda? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll go on to uh, staff update, broadband update, Tim Love. Good afternoon, commissioners. Got a quick update for you today on broadband. Uh, this is a topic that we talked about a few months ago, but uh, haven't in some time uh, for obvious reasons. But just wanted to update you on activities, uh, give you an idea of where we're headed, and sort of get some ideas from you as we move forward. Um, so background, and you've seen some of this information from me before, but just to reiterate uh, for y'all and for the public. So what we know, and there's a little, uh, there's a little number there that references the note. We did a survey um, last year, got about 2,500 responses. And so the data that I'm talking about today is informed by those responses. So first off, in terms of internet utilization, um, we know that of our respondents, 60% use the internet for educational purposes and 35% for business activities. Um, additionally, we know from an access standpoint, nearly 10% of our respondents said that they didn't have access to the internet. Uh, from an accessibility standpoint, 75% said the service was inadequate, so meaning like speeds, um, and 45% said it was too expensive. Uh, on the question of expense, you know, that's all relative, but we asked specifically, so how much are you paying in internet? And about 25% said they paid more than $75 a month for internet service, which where I live is an expensive price. Um, additionally, uh, COVID-19, uh, this really kind of reframed things um, as all of our kids went home, uh, couldn't go to school, had to work from home. Um, as, you know, some of us had to work from home, the use of internet was, you know, more necessary than ever just to do our basic necessities of school and work. So some of the actions we've taken to date, uh, you know, we did a community profile with an asset inventory. Uh, we did a community survey where we had 2,500 respondents. And then we hosted a provider meeting at that last calendar year where we had uh, 30 uh, broadband providers come and we shared data with them. So that's all background, that's kind of where we've been. So now let's talk about where we're going. Uh, so what's next? Um, in the short term, we've got a few ideas I wanna share with you, but also some longer term ideas. Uh, short term, we want to address assess accessibility gaps with existing providers where possible, and I'll, I'll talk about that more. Um, additionally, want, we want to implement the Community Center Broadband Project. Um, more to follow on this. And then we want to talk about the Buncombe Broadband Working Group. Uh, longer term, uh, we'd like to talk about a request for proposal process to get an idea of how we would address some of these needs that we have. But uh, I've got slides on all of this, so we'll, we'll dig in. Um, in terms of addressing accessibility gaps with existing providers, uh, the goal here is to identify near-term broadband opportunities, so not planning 12 months from now, let's do something two months from now, uh, that have little to no county cost. So how do we utilize what we already have to address some gaps um, that improve overall what we're doing, but are just band-aids at the end of the day? These aren't comprehensive solutions. Uh, so some examples of those in the action steps, you see the Land of Sky Wi-Fi lot project, and that's the map that's on the right, and there's a web address right underneath it. So Land of Sky has gone through a process to map uh, public access points where folks can go get on the internet. You know, these aren't people's houses, these are libraries, these are parking lots in some cases, where you can go get on the internet. So if you go to this website, you click on any of those red dots, uh, it's going to give you an address so you can go access the internet. Clearly not ideal in uh, COVID-19 uh, time frame because you can't go in libraries in a lot of cases, um, but perhaps you can get access in the parking lot. Um, I do recognize that's not a long-term solution. Um, if I'm trying to do homework every day, I don't want to have to go sit in a parking lot to do so. But uh, this is a short-term, low-cost option. And when I say low-cost, no-cost option. Um, additionally, we're looking at uh, bullet two, which is county-owned tower redeployment. And so uh, Buncombe County has, you know, 
35 plus towers that we use for various purposes. Um, you know, we have cellular providers that use those towers. Um, in many cases, we have space on these towers that can be reutilized uh, for what we call fixed wireless providers. And so think of this, and I'm oversimplifying it, outdoor Wi-Fi, basically. If you can see the tower, you can probably get internet from it. There's a number of providers locally uh, that provide the service currently. Um, and so what we want to do is work with those providers to see, you know, what they can do in the short term to, re to utilize these towers. Um, again, with the goal being, you know, minimal county cost, but also not a comprehensive solution. You know, uh, all of our towers aren't um, intriguing to providers. You know, it's a supply and demand thing at the end of the day. Um, our best towers are those that have the, the largest populations around them, for instance, near the city of Asheville. Uh, but many of those towers, you know, are either already deployed on or, you know, they already have other options. So in our goal to try to address the gaps, um, this doesn't always work as a solution. Does that make sense? It's a supply and demand kind of deal. But nonetheless, that's an option we can take. We're going to move forward with it, low-cost, Band-Aid type solutions to provide uh, accessibility gaps in, in the current term. Uh, the next idea is something that you may have heard about. This happened right before uh, we really started focusing on the pandemic. Uh, but we were awarded uh, a grant from the Appalachian Regional Commission uh, to do a community center broadband project. And, you know, I've oversimplified it here, but the basic idea is ARC uh, is funding uh, the installation of equipment to provide broadband at three community centers in Buncombe County and one in Transylvania. Uh, the three in Buncombe County, I'll show you on the next slide, um, are opportunities, again, for us to provide Band-Aid solutions. We're not uh, covering every community center. We've just picked three. We try to target those in areas that have accessibility gaps. But we've also, in order to move forward with this, have to go through an RFP process. Uh, we don't want to cut any of our providers out of the process. So Land of Sky will be issuing an RFP um, later this month to see what options uh, the providers can give us. We are asking for quote unquote COVID proof solutions. Um, and you know, they, it makes sense when you think about it. You know, it's great when you can get inside of a community center and use the internet, it's more comfortable. Uh, but that may not always be the case, especially if we see additional spikes as we move through the rest of the year. And I can't predict that, that's not my job, but it is my job to think about what we do if we can't get inside of a building. Also important to think about community centers that maybe aren't open all the time um, for whatever reason. So the ability to use the interior for uh, broadband as well as the exterior, so parking lots, is, is critical. Um, not ideal, but critical. So in terms of what we'll move next, uh, we plan to issue an RFP in June. This is through Land of Sky. It's a joint venture uh, between Buncombe and Transylvania. Uh, we'll award the RFP TBD. It depends on the, the, the products we get back. And then we'll hopefully implement in fall of 2020. Uh, the nice thing about this is this is a grant. Uh, so again, no county dollars put into this. Uh, we did have to match, uh, but the match is based on staff time. So at this point, we're saying, again, a, a no county cost solution to sort of move the needle a little bit in the broadband space. The ARC grant, the proposed location, so this map I showed you before, you can see those red circles. Those indicate kind of pockets where we saw gaps. Um, any of those uh, sort of light blue dots that I know are impossible for you all to see, those are places where a survey respondent indicated that the service was inadequate. So what we've done is we kind of group those together um, where you see a blue star. Those are the three community centers that were included in the ARC grant. So we're looking at the Leicester, Ox Creek, and Broad River community centers. So we're getting kind of a, a spread across the county. Um, we're also targeting it based on data, though, because you can see there's yellow, not yellow, there's blue dots behind each of those that indicates a survey respondent who said, hey, my service isn't good enough. Yeah, those are good choices. We tried to... We try to use the data to drive this. Um, what, I, what I think is interesting as well is this is a good way for us to pilot this. You know, so it's one thing for someone to say on a survey, hey, my internet isn't good. But then if we can provide it, we can sort of track it over time and see you know, how many users do we have. And if there's a sufficient number of users, then maybe that positions us to do something different moving forward. Any questions on the ARC grant? 
Good deal. So the, the next short-term solution doesn't really move the needle in terms of providing internet service, but I think it'll help guide kind of our next steps. And so what we're proposing is to create a short-term working group of local experts that will support Buncombe Broadband efforts. Uh, their primary task would be the development and evaluation of the Buncombe Broadband RFP. So this is a model that we've used elsewhere uh, with our solid waste RFP. Uh, we also used it recently um, during another RFP evaluation, but it's the idea of using not just Buncombe staff, but additional uh, experts in the field to help us evaluate RFPs, make sure that we're being objective and thinking about things that maybe we, we wouldn't normally. So the action steps here is, you know, we want to define the work group structure, and specifically I'm talking about on the work group, what kind of knowledge, skills, and abilities do we need? Um, I don't just need people with good intentions. We need people that, you know, understand broadband from a technical standpoint, because it is very technical. Uh, we need people with industry knowledge and relationships. You know, we can try to strong arm broadband providers, but that's not going to work unless we have a good relationship. Um, we also need people that have done this before, you know, so there are folks in our community who have experience implementing these programs locally, so we want to bring them in. Uh, potential membership could include uh, the North Carolina Department of Information Technology, <coughs> Land of Sky. Uh, we want to make sure that our schools are involved as well as our local governments and then uh, com community members that have worked in this field before. Uh, from there, we would develop and issue the RFP. As usual, you know, we're going to put the RFP out, but before we're going to sort of award a contract, we're going to bring that before this board so you see what the options are. Um, we have some confidence that we're going to get some responses back because we've talked to providers, um, but, you know, the range on those could vary substantially, and we want you all to be involved in that decision making. So this will be our plan, unless I hear some really strong feedback from you all, but we want to make sure that we have a group that's helping us guide this. So, Tim, I've got a, I've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, it's based on, um, really based on personal situation where I, the area that I live, we have um, DSL through AT&T. And I know that they just have different, and I don't really know what, what it's called, but they have different uh, powers, frequencies, whatever, that, that allows, I mean, the, the amount of speed that's needed today is just, it seems to increase over so some of the, sp the speed that 75 percent said it's inadequate mm -hmm. it's probably you know like my situation it's just slow yes and you're paying you know a, a high amount for it that's right and um and so you, you know you talk about uh, supply and demand i mean where you know what kind of pressure can be put on you know, you know, an AT and T or you know, or whatever to to see what their next step is. I mean, how hard is it to go from this speed to another speed in my area in Candler, for example? I don't know. I don't know the an I don't know the the answer to that. And so, um, it'd be good just to maybe get some of those questions answered. But the RFP is interesting. You know, that's yep. that's, that's a that's a big step. We've never had any, you know we've never moved in that direction before. So. Yep. That's good. Well, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about that RFP and, you know, our approach with the RFP on this slide, you know, so we want to solicit proposals, obviously, from vendors that provide comprehensive solutions. So we're looking for something broad, like, you know, let's dream big a little bit here. Um, and, you know, the goals for that, so scope countywide, but we want to prioritize areas that are, are limited in access. Uh, we, we don't need necessary proposals that just come back you know, and, and give us access in downtown Asheville, because in, in some ways that's, our access is good there, not perfect. We have different issues. Um, we want to make sure the proposals utilize our existing assets. I mentioned we've got 35 plus towers. We think those are valuable. We know they're valuable. Um, the reason we know they're valuable is because people are asking us to get on those towers. But we want to make sure that before we give access to those towers, we're doing something as part of a more cohesive solution. Um, you know, additionally, we want to be technology agnostic, and this gets to Commissioner Belcher's point. You know, DSL versus fixed wireless versus, you know, in-the-ground wireless, very different, different restrictions, different costs. And so we want the providers to come back with us and say, you know, in this part of Broad River, we think the best solution is X, Y, Z. Uh, most likely, it's not going to be digging a trench and land fiber. Um, could be. But we want them to come back and tell us what those solutions are. 
Um, it could be utilizing a tower in Broad River, uh, where if you can see it, you can get to the internet. So we want to see what those options are and let the providers kind of recommend solutions based on our geographic areas. Uh, you know, the timeline on that, we'd look to, once we get the work group in place, we'd want to get the, the RFP on the ground in fall of 2020. So we want to move something forward this year and then, you know, review those results with you in 2021. And this is just a rough time frame. Um, it depends on what comes back. If they say, guess what, we'll do it all for $500,000, we might be back sooner. But in reality, uh, we, we think it, this will be a bigger, more comprehensive, more difficult problem to solve, and probably one that we'll have to solve in phases incrementally. But that's OK. Um, we'll have that discussion with you all as we move forward. What questions do you all have? Tim, um, I know what the long term thing would be, but what, what can we, what's going to be addressed in the short term? When I say short term, by August of 2020, so that when if the governor decides that we're not going to let our schools back in the fall, our students will have a chance. I'm very concerned about losing that instruction face to face. Now they're having to try to go around the county to find internet, and that's just making it hard. And so I. Is there anything we can do between now and August? Sure. I think um, the, the two areas where I'm sort of focused in the near term, uh, one is redeploying uh, our existing towers. Uh, and we've got two discussions underway. I'm not going to talk about those publicly because of the nature of the discussion, um, where we hope a, a provider will be able to service those areas. Um, additionally, the ARC grant. Um, that I mentioned, uh, we're moving as fast as we can on that. And I think we may not be implemented by August. I need to get a timeline from the vendors, but I think we'll be close. And so I think those three community centers uh, will be lit up, as they say, in the broadband space. So I'm hip to the lingo. What, what other questions do you all have? No more questions. So. <laughs> Well, Tim, thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Okay, next to be uh, the COVID-19 discussion, uh, Dr. Mullendor and Fletch Tau. All right, good afternoon. So we'll start, I'll start by um, showing the dashboard as it stands live on our website. Um, all right, so um, just to give you an overall update, um, today we're at 350 cases um, and 29 deaths. Um, and of those 29 deaths, 24 were in residents of long-term care facilities. Um, Max, go ahead, well, let's start with the age group. So just in terms of the breakdown of the cases, you can see that um, 37% of the cases were in um, individuals aged 25 to 49, and then 65 and older uh, individuals made up 30% of the cases. Um, when we go to ethnicity, we see that we still have that disproportionality um, uh, of about 25% of cases being in individuals who identify as Hispanic or Latinx, when we know that our county's population is about 6.3%. Um, Go to race now, Max, if you don't mind. And again, we see disproportionality when we look at um, cases in terms of how they identified with about 6.9% uh, identifying as black or African American. When we again know that our population, county population is less than that. And then 14% uh, identifying, kind of lumping into Asian. Um, and, um, and so, you know, clearly that's concerning. And I've mentioned this before that you know, we've, we've heard it, Jasmine's mentioned it, um, I think before that just how um, inequities um, that we already know exist in many other health conditions are showing up here with um, cases, hospitalizations, and um, in, the, in the country as a whole, um, uh, and deaths in um, black, indigenous, and people of color. So I wanted to point that out. Um, in terms of uh, the testing, so you see we've had you know, almost 8,400 tests uh, completed as of today, knowing that there's you know, a lag time there and, um, uh, in terms of how quickly those get reported to us. 
But when I do the math about uh, cases and the number of tests that were done, we're about 4.2% positivity rate. Um, and when I go back, uh, May 8th, we were about 3%. When I think I last reported to you on May 19th, we were at 3.6%. Now we're at 4.2%, which is not the direction we want to go. Um, but the get, testing can, is going well. Can you give me those numbers again? The three, the, the yeah, three so 3% yeah. was our positivity rate on May 8th. 3.0. 3.0. 3 3.6 was May 19th, and 4.2 today. So again, that's not, I don't know how statistically significant um, uh, uh, that is, but it's still trending if we could compare 3 to 4.2%. Uh, the good news is testing is getting done. Um, I will say it is still, you know, it's no, nowhere near as streamlined as we want it to be in any way, shape, or form. Um, uh, but there are lots of providers out there doing testing um, uh, when they are worried about COVID-19. Um, in terms of the um, cases at the long-term care facilities, we still have four facilities that have outbreaks, um, 83 residents total. Uh, staffing, so I just I wanted to point something out because I haven't necessarily made this clear. We have to remember that we have people who work in this county who don't live in this county, right? And so um, uh, 59 staff total um, in these long-term care facilities are have COVID-19. Um, but not all of them are Buncombe County residents, right? So, so the, when you see the report that's on the state website, the report of the outbreaks, um, it's going to say, you know, a total of 59 staff, um, but only, as per my count, 46, 46 of them are Buncombe County residents. And that's not uncommon. We know we have people who live in this county who work in other um, counties as well. So um, you can go to the PowerPoint now, Max, if you want. Um, so this is that same dashboard, but with our um, kind of trend coloring. So again, I would say, you know, we're doing well. Um, could we do better with testing? Sure, we could always do better with testing. Um, contact tracing capacity, so we now have access to um, the platform that the state has rolled out to, um, to uh, help with contact tracing. We have we have requested staff from the Community Care North Carolina program that hired people, and um, it sounds like those will be coming on board any day now. Um, we are currently tr training our, we got access to this platform just days ago. And so our staff have been getting trained um, yesterday and today on that. Um, uh, so we're working, we're working to taking some of that load off our chemical disease nurses and other nurses and then um, giving the contact tracing responsibility to these Community Care of North Carolina hired individuals. Um, uh, we talked about trends, so our, you know, case counts going up, our positivity rates going up. Um, uh, we've heard from um, Dr. Hathaway, if you listened yesterday to the, to the media briefing, you know, there are seeing more individuals being admitted um, with um, COVID-19. Um, in terms of their ICU availability, still look at, looking fine. Um, PPE is still fine. Um, ventilator is still fine. But it's just, you know, something we expected would happen. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're all just watching that closely. Um, and in terms of uh, syndromic surveillance, what that, mean, what that means is the visits to the emergency department for symptoms that fit COVID-19. Um, and that is a more regional, that, that can't be drilled down necessarily to the county level, very easy. So regionally, um, that number is decreasing, but then not everybody goes to the emergency department with, um, with those symptoms. So it's a, you know, there's limitations to all this data. Um, any questions about any of that? Yeah. Thank you. This is really great to have it presented this way. Um, it might be something y'all are planning to address, but I would love to hear what your current thoughts are on sort of ha um, what we're looking for in this data. And, um, you know, we, as we've discussed many times, we knew that with various stages of reopening, we'd see cases go up, we'd see deaths go up, unfortunately. Um, but just to hear your latest thinking about, um, are, you know, are we at the point where, where there's any kind of numbers around which we would say, hey, gosh, 
it's concerning enough that we might need to think about re-implementing some strategies or are we all kind of navigating kind of a little more in real time and, and we'll make that decision as we... Yeah, I've, when I've heard, um, and this was a while ago, but when I've heard um, like the state uh, epidemiologists talk about stuff, they don't talk about like a, a number or a threshold, it's more the trend, mm -hmm. right? And so um, we are working on, I know our, our business intelligence folks are working on additional um, uh, things to add to this dashboard, which would include that positivity rate, which would show what the trend of that. Um, we're gonna add more information, I think this week, about the demographics of the death, um, those who've died from COVID-19. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that it's, um, it's the whole picture, like the trends. But I, w I would say, yeah, we expect the case to go up. The positivity rate is somewhat concerning to me. I think the hospital stuff is important to follow. Um, because that's, that's what we always said this, these measures were to do, right, was, was to prevent overwhelming our health care system, right, to make sure that there was adequate PPE, to make sure there were adequate ICU beds and ventilators. And so um, uh, I think that's what we need to keep looking at. And just a quick follow-up on that. Um, and maybe, again, it's just helpful to kind of hear how you all are thinking about this as we move through it is, it seems, as you think about both the number of cases we have and then the number of deaths we have, that our death rate is actually pretty high relative to both other counties and the state. And it seems like that would follow from if most of our infections are happening in right. long-term care facilities, people are more fragile and unfortunately more likely to die. But I, I guess th that's something that I kind of just keep thinking about, partly thinking about the families involved, but also just partly thinking about like what, what does that tell us? and is there anything, does that mean we're doing a good job at infection control and so generally at the level of a community and so we're not seeing, other communities have like 1,300 cases and 40 deaths. We have 350 cases and 20, almost 30 deaths. So anyway. Yeah, and mortality rate's hard, right? Because yeah. again, not everybody, while again, testing is getting better and more people getting tested, that's always been the problem is you don't really know all the cases out there because for so long people were told to stay home. And so mortality rate is, um, I think, one of those things we won't have a good grasp on until much um, later when we have fully, you know, anybody can get tested um, quite quite easily. So, um, so yeah, I haven't really, uh, I, I just knowing that limitation and the number of tests, which I think is really uh, the number of cases is not at it. You know, accurate, um, especially from those months ago when we didn't weren't doing testing. Um, at this point, I don't put a whole lot of stock into our mortality rate. I guess. Yeah. A so question. question <clears throat> a question I have. <clears throat> uh, how? Uh, I mean, are we testing in the nursing homes that haven't been? You know, I know the four. What about the rest of them? So here. So this is. I, I wish you guys could come and join my, my calls with these long-term care facilities. So um, we had a call this morning. Every week we have a call. We invite them all. Clearly we're on the phone. The community nurses are on the phone with, um, um, with them daily. But some of them have um, been able to obtain the resources to be able to start doing or to at least do one-time testing of all their staff and residents. Some have done that. Um, and in some of those cases, they've found no ca nothing, right? No, no positive results in any staff and residents. Um, a few have found like one case in a resident or one case in a staff member. But the many, and many of them are looking at that recommendation because we've shared that with them and said, if you're able to do this, like we want you to do it. But, but um, I've, I brought my notes here so I could read to you like the things that they're, they're telling me, you know, they're, they're looking at it it's just very complicated to, to amass, you know, do all those testing. When you think about they might have, you know, 150 residents, 150 staff, it gets very costly very quickly. Um, and it's, they're not, they're worried about the sustainability of it. Because doing it one time, again, is a snapshot in time, but it's not the end all be all. And the recommendation is to keep doing weekly testing of your employees. We've had instances last week where one of our facilities who is in the midst of an outbreak, their employee insurance said, we're not paying anymore for these employees to get tested. That's a hundred and basically a hundred dollars at least out of pocket. These employees would have to pay 
or the facility would have to pay in order for, for their staff to continue to get weekly testing. We're hearing that other health insurance companies are saying um, we aren't going to cover testing of asymptomatic employees in these facilities unless the test is ordered by their personal physician. That is, a, that is a barrier, right? That is not helping with streamlined testing. And so I've shared those concerns with the state, um, DHHS folks, and they're gonna take that to their payers group, which involves all the state uh, and the insurance companies in the state. But, but that's like one, right? That's, that's one issue we're running into where who's paying for the test. And so some of these facilities are digging into their pockets and paying for it. We, um, I was on a phone call this morning, Range Urgent Care, I can't say enough good things about them. I lauded them yesterday in the media event. I'm gonna laud them again today. They have really stepped up um, and worked with these facilities to get in there and do collection of specimens and get the, the specimens tested through partnership with LabCorp, with MAKO Medical Group, Medical Lab. Um, so there is an opportunity that if we as a county really want to help support these facilities doing this testing, there, there, um, there is an opportunity financially where um, the county could help, you know, get into contract with MAKO and say if, if facilities, you know, are trying to do the testing but they're running into barriers where there's no insurance company to pay for their employee testing, um, that, uh, you know, MAKO, the lab could invoice the county for testing, or we could work out a deal with the facilities. I mean, this is, we're hitting that wall where if this is what um, we're trying to get these facilities to do, um, it's time to look at how we as a county might financially support that testing. Or I think you need to mention that we've asked for a proposal so we can get an idea of cost yeah, to and I, to you. We don't know what that looks like. And I have, I got a contract this morning, a draft contract this morning from MAKO. I, um, they would be in partnership with, they basically they would um, hire range to go in and do the testing potentially, or MAKO would send people out here to do testing. So there's, there's multiple re ways, but, but we're hitting that wall right now already. Um, and so I think that's what the other facilities are worried about. Like if I start doing this, now and I'm supposed to keep doing this weekly we're you know this is June we this isn't going to go away for a while how am I going to sustain this and so um this is this is bigger than Buncombe County by far but uh, we might have to come up with a local solution to this massive problem um did that answer your question mm -hmm. okay thanks yeah. so um yeah, the nursing homes currently what guidance do we have for them specifically so we um, we have sh we have shared the recommendation from the CDC which is also from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services that says uh, baseline testing before you have a case baseline testing of all your employees and staff and then weekly employee testing from there on out okay. um, but again I, I've hesitated to say you must do that because I know I know the barriers I mean every weekend I feel like I'm on a call trying to uh, logistically get testing set up for facilities that are in the midst of like having an outbreak or dealing with an outbreak where something, you know, where all of a sudden they find out, oh, that's not gonna pay for it anymore. How can I do it? And so I've hesitated to say you have to do this because I know there are so many steps that have to go, they have to fall into place for them to actually be able to implement that plan. For those facilities that once they have a case, then we say, okay, you have to test everybody, all staff and all residents um, initially, and then um, again, weekly until you get two weeks without a new case identified, all right? And then they would go back to just testing their staff weekly. So again, th there are, in terms of they need to find the, if they don't have the staff internally to do the testing, they have to find a healthcare provider to come in and do the testing. They have to have a lab who can run the test. They have to have a way to pay for all that, make sure they have adequate PPE. Um, and then they have to be prepared to handle the results, right? Knowing how to cohort. And they're, they're doing, I would say, um, it's, it's great to be on those calls. They're learning from each other. Um, uh, you know, Aston Park, who's in the midst of, of this, you know, a horrible outbreak, is being very willing, like, here's what we're learning, here's what we recommend, here's what we would do, you know, and, and to hear them learn from each other, um, and, and they all know they're in it together, 
um, and they want to help each other out. It's, 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 again, it's a, it's a heartwarming story in the midst of such tragedy. So if you, if you had no um, restraint, <laughs> so I'll just give you a little story, and commissioners, I'd ask if you just endure this personal discussion. Uh, my mother passed away uh, a couple of years ago. She spent many years in Aston Park. Uh, I'm very familiar with um, what families do, what they documents they sign, decisions they make regarding the care of that loved one. Uh, I would, you know, when I saw the uh, the numbers associated with the nursing homes, the first thing that I thought that I would do, the first thing that I thought is that, look, that I would do whatever I could do to stop it from getting there, okay? And because, um, I mean, what, you know, what took my mother home in the last, you know, the last time was a fever. They are very fragile. So I can't imagine, you know, COVID gets in. I mean, you know, and it, the, I mean, the, you know, the anything, the flu, pneumonia. Typically, uh, I would guess that most of those that pass, you know, with the, that pneumonia is an is an issue and a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, that occurs. Yeah. And so when that occurs, that uh, that family has either uh, immediate decisions to make or decisions they've already made. Mm -hmm regarding that and so you know I would think that you know and um, I understand we're going through an opening phase and that we could we could expect uh, some um, you know cases as a, res as a result of that but when we look at our, our um, the unfortunate deaths uh, you know we have 29 24 mm -hmm. are in nursing homes mm -hmm. I don't want to use terms like only five. I don't want to. I don't want to use that. But twenty-four are in nursing homes. So I would want to know the money. I would want to know how much it costs. I would want to know what is the war room action plan for nursing homes. Not 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 retail. Right. And I'm not going to get on a soapbox, but I would want to know for that population for nursing homes. Uh, I could get pretty emotional in this conversation, but I'm not going to. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a fact, a, a, a difficult fact. And if, um, if there's insurance situations, things such as you're discussing, you know, then that goes on a board. We figure out how we're going to handle those. You know, you, you just mentioned a way that's a possibility. County manager just mentioned that we were looking at those numbers. You know, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and I'm not saying that because we haven't done X, Y, or Z that we're not doing what we ought to be doing at this point. But to me, you know, when I see 29 deaths and 25 are in nursing homes, you know, then to me it's, um, you know, it's put it up on the wall, all hands on deck, figure out how to, how to stop that from getting in there. I have numerous friends uh, that have... Uh, uh, um, family members in, in Aston Park and others, but particularly in Aston Park, I guess it's maybe, you know, the, the reputation has been so good within the people that I know in the community that my friends and their families, you know, happen to, to seek that place out. But, uh, and I think one of the other things about, about Aston Park is Aston Park has an incredible dementia um, um, department. Um, it used to be uh, the 500 wing. And, you know, t you know, I'll just tell you what happened with my mother. She was in a 500 wing. She had, you know, dementia that progressed very, very uh, severely. And then she failed. And then when they fall, they go to another point because they can't move. And then things go from there. And then so if, if, if a, a, a virus such as COVID or, or anything would show up in that facility, I, when I first heard, I, I'm like, I cannot even imagine because it's just they're, they're, it's so fragile. So whatever we can do, uh, and I'm not being, again, I'm not being reckless or emotional on this, but 
but when I see 29 and 25 are in nursing homes, then to me it's a, you know, develop a plan, give great, you know, a lot of ideas and, and some information you've given today has been very helpful. But so I'll stop with that discussion, so, but thank you all for allowing me to do that. Commissioner, I do want to weigh in and I'll ask Dr. Mullendore to expand some more, but exactly what you said is where we started. We started our planning back in March, targeting nursing homes, and you were in the EOC with us, and that was day one. After we got food organized for the kids for school, our next topic was long-term care, and we spent lots of time figuring out how to keep it from even getting in there in the first place. Um, and that plan that you talked about on a war room, we, ha we started that with our priorities. And one of the things that we did is we sent our employees of our mental health, employees and our fire marshals to every nursing home. And not just a skilled nursing home, but anyone that had residential senior care in their facilities. Mm -hmm. And we started targeting our plan and working that plan to make sure we don't get it there. Um, we have 211 facilities in our community that takes care of our senior folks. Ashton Park are the big ones, but they're also small at-home sure. care facilities. And we personally visited everyone, gave them guidance on how to make sure they don PPE, how to access, um, whether it's testing, how it's supplies, education. We spent time making sure we focused on that community because we agree that it's very fragile. And Dr. Mullendore can expand on that as she cares to. But And since then, we've gone back a second time. As she mentioned, we have weekly calls, just like we do with our business community. We also prioritize our long-term care and any congregate living facility in our community. Um, so we've been working really hard, and it was heartbreaking for us to even get it in one facility. Oh, I'm sure. Um, there was no guidance really coming from state. We were trying to create our own guidance and trying to make sure we do that in a responsible manner. So we have looked at, she t I didn't know we had a contract. That was news. Well, that just came today. in this like yeah. this morning. <laughs> um, but Good. Good. we have been working. How can we get tests and organized? So public health's role has not been ever in history of public health has been the ones doing that actual testing. But we have been providing guidance to make sure that testing is available in our community well beyond what we would typically do as a public health organization. So the next thing we talked about is can Buncombe County staff do that testing? And the answer is that's not a sustainable model as well. So what else can we do? Can we coordinate and can we contract with someone that we could set up to go do that test? And we call it a strike team. So we do have a strike team for assistance. And we did actually do testing in one community that could not get testing. On a Saturday, we took our folks and said, well, hopefully, we, I know you work Monday to Friday, but let's do one Saturday and go do this. You can't do that to our staff day in and day out. Right. But we did do that for one instance where we knew we needed to get in there quickly and do some testing. So that war room that you're talking about, it is there. <coughs> We're working at it on a daily basis. Now we struggle on how to actually get funding done. The federal reimbursement that or we're in urgent care is counting on. They're having problems as well. We've not been able, so we've been reaching out to Senator Tillis's office and other offices. Can you get help to get these people paid? Because at some point, we need to have revenues and resources to get things paid as well. So we're not doing this without that big overarching plan that you mentioned. So I think if uh, just a couple of points, um, I, I, I couldn't think of the term. It was EOC and War Room came out from a previous business, sorry. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, it is important to acknowledge, as I said, that, that a, a fever can, in this fragile population, can, can take, you know, that, make, make that difficult passing. Um, I would like to, I would like to know, um, I'm glad we're having this conversation, number one. I, w I would like to see this information provided uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a regular meeting where it can just be very simple and very, you know, you can, we can have our, you know, our ducks in a row so people can hear that, know that, be comforted by whatever information we can give them. Uh, I think it can be delivered better than uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the briefings that we have where we have to have a certain cadence, you know, so that we can do the sign, sign and, and other things. Uh, I, I, think, um, um, I think people need to hear uh, the way you normally speak. So, I know. Yeah, yeah, and you can deliver it that way. And the, but they, I think they, this is information they, they need to hear. And when we, when we hear, if we can make an investment or if we should, you know, then uh, that would be good information also. It's a difficult conversation, but it needs to be had, and that information needs to be dissected, um, you know, for, for sure. 211. 
Yeah, and that includes, I would say that includes like, um, you know, all the adult care homes, family care homes. I think it also includes the um, more the, the congregate living settings in general, right? Yeah. So, yeah, not just at senior living. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions before I move on? What did you guys say? About long-term care facilities? Yeah, so if we go back to my PowerPoint, there were some other things I think you guys, you all had questions about. Um, you can go to the next slide. So community testing, just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, and so we, uh, today is uh, the sixth round of uh, community testing sites. So we have completed um, 312 tests so far as of the end of last week. Um, uh, and uh, I was at Klondike earlier and things were going well there. So um, um, that we're gonna continue that for the foreseeable future um, uh, and looking at the data to drive where we're going to go and do the testing. Um, you had questions about the the clusters of illness where we were seeing um, illness. I mentioned before funerals, funeral related events like gatherings in some way related to um, celebrating somebody's um, life. Um, that has been a cluster. Clearly the long-term care facilities are our largest. Um, we've also seen clusters of cases associated with construction sites, um, food packing, um, places, the hospital, you heard about the, um, the cases um, from Bill Hathaway. And then, you know, just the large household sizes, right? So when you, when you have a large household, you're at close contact, um, it it's pretty much spreads to everybody in that household. So yeah, it's, it's essentially anywhere where people have close contact with others for extended periods of time and are not wearing face coverings or not um, uh, practicing the, the hygiene. Um, practices that we recommend. Um, in terms of testing breakdown, um, when I did the math, um, the long-term care facilities, again, have done the majority of tests, um, uh, about 3,100 tests uh, conducted at long-term care facilities by my count. Um, hospitals, so, uh, you know, we're talking about mission, we're talking about the VA, we're talking about uh, Advent and party, and then also a few smattering of others um, have done close to 2,000 tests. Um, primary care providers, so we got pediatricians out there, we got family docs, internists, all doing testing, um, uh, you know, close to uh, uh, 1,750 1, tests being done by them. And then the urgent cares, again, Mercy Urgent Care has been doing a lot of testing along with range. Um, and so about uh, 1,400 tests more and more um, done at those facilities. So again, it's it, there are many opportunities um, from primary care providers, urgent cares, the hospitals, community testing sites um, where people are able to get testing. And then the opportunity was the one I mentioned to you about the helping out with um, long-term care facility testing. So if there are any other questions, I will take them. Otherwise, I'll get back to work. All right. Thank you. No. Okay, thank you oh, very much. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of hard work y'all been doing and we really appreciate it. And the stress has been hard and I know we all appreciate it and I do. Uh, Fletch, you have anything or? No, You're good, okay. Well, next uh, open discussion, uh, name of a meeting. So there's a. I think everyone's got a second page here. Uh, my question on this, uh, Avril, is, you know, we've always called it a pre-meeting, hadn't we? Or it was a three-by-three three at first and then become a pre-meeting, which most of this is uh, future meetings, right? Instead of we hardly ever go in over anything that's the same day as a meeting, correct? Right. So. Yes. We actually go over it two weeks ahead to give you time to ask questions or research. Yep. So one of the things we were trying to combat was the, um, the conversation around there was no oversight of staff and you were getting things at the last minute to vote on. So one of the reasons we brought a pre-meeting is to give you two weeks notice of any big items that we were bringing forward to you for vote. But the question came up as well because this meeting, sometimes you give guidance or you give direction to staff, it's not a vote. 
Um, and they wanted to, and Commissioner Newman, when we talked with him, he wanted to make sure that the title showed that to the public, yeah. that they know it wasn't just a meeting that we just talk about items because guidance is given. And the last one that we can talk about and point to guidance was when we bought the ambulance before you, it was a conversation. But you all, we talked about an ambulance that we can purchase and you kind of gave us some guidance to where you wanted us to go. So he was thinking, and the reason I'm putting it on the board is for you guys to weigh in and give us some direction. Is, this, is pre meeting the right term that you want to use or was there a different name that you would prefer that would kind of encapsulate the fact that there's direction given, maybe not a vote, not a formal vote, but some guidance and direction is sometimes given to staff at these meetings. Okay. okay so I, I, would, I would put that question to uh, Ms. Ms. Hockaday. Is there an issue with us having a pre-meeting? So we post all of that, it's online, we're posting everything that's on the pre-meeting. I know the, the original intent for, for me of the pre-meeting was that there, as, as the, the county is an ongoing operation, an ongoing, you could say, uh, business, and there's things that we should know about mm -hmm. that are being worked on, and then it airs it in the public and provides additional information then later if right. we tend to those things at some point will show up on a meeting i mean if yes, they're sir. budget items if at some point they'll show up now uh, sometimes we've got a little zealous in our in our pre-meetings and decided that we wanted to have a regular meeting because we wanted to vote on something but that's not we've not done that a lot i don't think that's not typical i agree i don't think so um. So the clerk and, and Stacy actually went through and looked at other North Carolina counties that have mm -hmm. meetings and came up with a list of names is what you have here that they call it. Whether it's the work sessions are typically single focus, like we do budget work sessions and that's all we talked yeah, about on some right. of them. But there's no real definition or description. So it's up to you what name you would like to rename this or keep it as is. That will be your call. Well, the way I look at it, why recreate the wheel? It is a pre-meeting. That's what we're doing. I mean, God, we got a lot of other things we need to worry about other than the name of the meeting. I mean, pre-meeting is fine, isn't it? Uh, personally, myself, I like the fourth one there, a briefing is what we're having for the future. Uh, you know, it's not really a pre-meeting of what we're going over that day, so that's kind of where I stand on the briefing. I mean, if I lean towards any of those four, it would be that one. When, I mean, before you even said that, I looked at that and I felt was going to lean towards one. Presidential briefings. I mean, because, I mean, technically that's what it is, what it is but I'm kind of I'm over here. I could actually get stuck with my, my friend right here. At, well, I'm, you know, gotta change everything. I, I'm either it. way. All I think is let's move on. Let's decide on it and go. I don't want to see us waste. Huh? Waste a lot of time on. I like Robert's idea. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good on. with it. Yeah. yeah, I'm fine. Go ahead. I like Robert's idea. Yeah, let's move right. on. I like yeah. Robert's idea, and we can move on. Yeah. Briefing. Let's not waste a lot of time on this. Technically, yeah, that's what it is. All right. Cool. <laughs> I just looked at the the clerk. Yeah, I'm who fine. Make that happen, right? <laughs> Joe, I, we got a lot hey, of other ways. Just, just to say, <laughs> the one that I kicked out right off the gate. Is y'all want to guess? No. For chops. Committee, Committee of the, of the whole. whole. Oh, good gracious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a special kind of hell. <laughs> yeah. I don't like you need create a committee something, <laughs> something is not. I've never liked it. I agree. I'm not even going to do that. I agree right. with you. I agree. All right. No problem with me on that one. So we will rename and make that our, our briefing is what we yeah, want to call it. And it yeah, you know, fine. and so Ooh, it would be uh, the, you know, the June 16th briefing is what it is. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. We make some amazing decisions in this room. Yeah. Yeah. No that's wonder there's so much pressure on us. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next one now. Good job. Yes, sir. Good job there. The 
Okay, we're ready. Uh, the July board meeting schedule, it's on the uh, second page that we got. 2016, we had no July meetings. And I think most of us was here except uh, Commissioner Edward and Penland. And then 17, we had two, but there was a reason with the investigation going on. We yeah. had a lot of things going on. And then 18, we only had one July meeting. Can't remember that, but. And then 19, so where's, where are we at on that? Yeah. What's your pleasure? We were thinking that well, 4th of July, we could cancel that first meeting, yeah. but really it is your pleasure. What do you want to do? Um, I would recommend that we not, we at least have one meeting that month and not, yeah, I would think so. we have yeah. too much going yeah. on. Yeah. Have what's one, going on? The third, the skip the, the first, first part, do the second part, which would be the third Tuesday, is that right? Correct. Do we know the date on that? 21st. 21st. July 21st. Uh, I could do the 21st. We can But we have a June have 23rd 20 special 30. meeting. We have 23rd. We're having a June 23rd special meeting, and we could add items to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so actually, no, we already advertised for it now. Yeah. But okay. Cool. Thanks for that info, Lamar. So we good? 21st? I'm good with it. I think that gives everyone time to enjoy the July 4th holiday, to make their plans and go out. But... There again, with what's going on, we could always it. call a oh, meeting oh, on the oh, 7th. No, 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 no. Well. <laughs> There's places you can go, Commissioner. You know that. I, I, I just want to get in my car and just drive and drive and drive one of these days. I'm looking forward to it. And to your point, sir, if anything comes up, we can always call with 48 hour special meeting. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But we think we should be fine. So, when is the, the final budget? So on June 16th is a public hearing, and then on June 23rd we need to come back and, and do that. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at Michael now because I believe we could also adopt on the 23rd, on the 16th after the, if you didn't want to come back on the 23rd, we could adopt on the 16th if you all are here, right? If you all are here in person, we could adopt on the 16th. Okay. The idea was that we would have a public hearing, and the next week we will come back and do the actual vote on the budget. Yeah. But you have an option. To decide if you want to have the hearing take a break and if there's any issues or changes you want us to implement we can do that and then come back that same night and adopt and we'll be done on the 16th so let me ask you a question on so you talk about public hearing is there is there a way to i mean are we getting enough public input on the budget i mean are we getting it? i mean i, I get i mean i'm, I'm so getting I it have that. to me you know where people will call me or you know, particularly playgrounds, they love them, you know, and other things, you know, but are we getting I had it as a topic for the tonight's meeting. It is? Okay. Yes, when I present the budget for you, the recommended budget, I had that as a topic of how do you want to handle the public here? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, how do we handle getting more public comment and all that, so. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That is all that we have on the pre-meeting agenda, the briefing agenda. I believe that's it. So, so at 4:02 we will call this adjourned. Good.